Hello, cats and kittens. Here we are for the introduction to Romeo and Juliet. This is just a little overview of some background and context that will help you to understand a little bit more about Romeo and Juliet before we get into the actual uh, the actual movie. Now, normally I have students perform Romeo and Juliet in class. Uh, of course, we're not going to be able to do that. I also have students view a, a movie of Romeo and Juliet. So we will be doing that and we'll just be reading bits and pieces of the actual play. Now, for those of you who are really interested in, in reading the text of Romeo and Juliet, I will have that available as an extra credit assignment. So um, if you'd like to do that, I will um, provide that for you starting next week. That will be available for you to look at online. So, um, absent being able to perform Romeo and Juliet in class, we will be talking about it um, in segments so that we don't get too overwhelmed. Um, I will also give you guys a chance to make some props, well, even though we're not going to be performing the, the play in class. We're just mixing things up here a little bit, um, being flexible with the situation. All right, so Romeo and Juliet was written in circa 595. You may remember that circa means about or approximately. So we know that Romeo and Juliet was written in about 1595. We don't know for certain, but we can base this on things such as playbills for the, the play itself and other documentation. Um, and it was probably Shakespeare's 10th play. And of course we say probably because we are piecing together information from a long time ago. Here you see a classic scene from the play in which Romeo climbs up uh, to Juliet's room and they meet uh, under the, the cover of darkness. Well, there's, there's a bit of light going on, which we will see. All right, so um, now we mentioned that Romeo and Juliet was probably Shakespeare's 10th play. Just to put that in context, um, here are his plays that we know of. Now this list divides these into comedies, histories, and tragedies. This is the common categorical breakdown of Shakespeare's plays. Um, later people have developed other categories such as uh, tragic comedies, um, or they might even add romance in here. Uh, but these are the classic categories. So we've got comedies, histories, and tragedies. Now we're going to be getting into the elements of tragedy. Romeo and Juliet is a tragedy, um, so it falls into this category. Uh, we'll be talking about what makes something a tragedy. We won't be getting into details about what makes something a comedy, so I'll just tell you briefly here. Comedies are of course funny, but the big thing um, in Shakespeare's comedy is that they end well. So the story ends well, and so you can sort of think of it, um, the, the title to this play kind of sums up what a comedy is about all's well that ends well. And normally uh, ending well means that people get married. So sometimes a uh, two, two lovers will get married, um, but sometimes uh, several groups of people, um, several couples will get married um, at the end of a comedy. So all's well that ends well. And then for the histories, I actually really like Shakespeare's histories. They're not for everyone. I do suggest that if you would like to go see a history play, familiarize yourself with the plot first because they can be pretty dense to get through. But uh, generally look, looking back in history. Um, so those are our three categories and we have Romeo and Juliet right here as a classic Shakespearean tragedy. All right, so um, Shakespeare wasn't the first one to come up with Romeo and Juliet. In fact, it was a classic story that was drawn from other places. Um, 
this is this is very typical uh, during the Renaissance, where artists and authors would draw upon classic literature. You remember that in the Renaissance, this was an aim to go back to the ancient times and bring back what was really great about Europe back in the ancient times. And drama was no exception, so that uh, Romeo and Juliet was drawn from a, a Roman story. Um, probably uh, best told or most famously told by a poet named Ovid. Ovid. Um, now Ovid wrote a, a very long poem called the Metamorphoses. Now the Met Metamorphoses means change and so these were a series of stories within this poem about change. And Pyramus and Thisbe was one of those stories. Um, many of these stories being related to romance or passion. So there have been many adaptations of the story of Pyramus and Thisbe. Now honor students um, are working or will be working on reading the actual text to Pyramus and Thisbe and getting into some of the um, some of the, the details and the figurative language associated with this story. But we're not going to do that as a class as a whole. We're just going to get a quick idea as to the story of Pyramus and Thisbe. Pyramus and Thisbe lived in Babylonia growing up as neighbors. As they grew older, they fell in love with one another. In all the East, Pyramus was the most handsome of all young men, and Thisbe was the fairest beauty. As their families hated each other, however, they were forced to keep their love a secret. To avoid being seen together, the young lovers would often come to the wall that separated their properties and speak to one another through a small crack that had developed in the wall. One beautiful day, they sat next to the crack and mourn their situation, seeing the birds flying together with total freedom. They decided then and there that they couldn't remain apart any longer, and so they agreed to meet that night beneath a mulberry tree that stood outside the city gates. When night fell, Thisbe managed to sneak out first, her face hidden by a veil, and she came to the meeting place. As she waited for Pyramus, however, a lioness arrived, having just killed some prey as there was a stream that ran alongside the mulberry tree. Frightened, Thisbe hid inside a nearby cave, but in her haste she dropped the veil which the lioness shredded with her bloody jaws. It was then that Pyramus arrived and scared off the lioness. When he saw Thisbe's bloody and torn veil lying on the ground, however, he assumed that the lioness had killed her. Distraught, Pyramus drew his sword and plunged it into his stomach, staining the white fruit of the tree with his blood. Now returning from hiding in the cave, Thisbe saw what had befallen her lover. Moaning in agony, she took the bloody sword and fell upon it, asking the gods that their love be remembered. To mark their sad, unrequited love, the gods forever made it so that the fruit of the mulberry tree always turns dark purple when it becomes ripe. This has been Jordan with Knowledge HQ. If you enjoyed this quick myth story, please consider giving some love to that like button. The myth of Pyramus and Thisbe may have sounded quite familiar to you if you've ever read the play Romeo and Juliet, as Shakespeare's play draws heavily from this myth as recounted by the Roman poet Ovid. For more videos on mythology and the ancient world, please consider subscribing to this channel. And remember, anything can be mastered one step at a time. All right, so you get a feel for the original story. Um, we'll be, uh, the honor students will be referring back to that story to get a feel for the major elements that um, were inspirations for Romeo and Juliet. Now, the story wasn't just about Pyramus and Thisbe, however. Um, over time, the story of Romeo and Juliet became popular in 16th century Italy. And there was an author named Luigi da Porto, and he wrote a novel, Giulietta e Romeo, in 1530. So uh, this is well before Romeo 
<laughs> before Shakespeare wrote Romeo and Juliet. Now, there was also an English version of the story, and this was written by Arthur Brooke in 1562, so again, before Shakespeare wrote his play. It, um, it was a long poem called The Tragical History of Romeo and Juliet. So um, this is one of those stories that gets carried on and retranslated through time. Now, the stories are similar, but Shakespeare's telling of the story is a little different. Um, he, he changed things up, mostly in terms of the pacing. Um, the length of the main character's romance is very, very quick. Things happen very, very quickly instead of over time, and so this makes for very good drama. We also have Shakespeare introducing and developing many side characters. And with that, with those side characters come side conflicts. Um, so there's a lot more going on in Shakespeare's retelling of Romeo and Juliet than we might have found in some of the first stories. So once again, it becomes a fast, fast paced, tragic love story. Um, and coming on the stage at the time that it did, it was quite revolutionary. This is not something that people were used to seeing on the stage. And so it was something new and different. So it wasn't just, oh, same old, same old, here's the story of Romeo and Juliet. But it was a fairly familiar story, which may have lent to its popularity. Now, of course, um, you might be aware that Romeo and Juliet has had many, many modern interpretations, both on the stage and off. Um, and some of these include West Side Story. This is a musical and a movie. Um, after we go through Romeo and Juliet, I highly recommend seeing West Side Story. It is just a very well done version of the story taking place more in the modern day. Now I say modern day, not in 2020, um, but um, in, in the more modern era. We have Nomeo and Juliet. This is the animated film. Now, Nomeo and Juliet is cute, but uh, it, it mostly just has references to Romeo and Juliet. The story itself is really quite different as you might expect from an animated film. Now, uh, we also have Romeo and Juliet, the 1968 movie version featuring Leonard Whiting and Olivia Hussey. This is the one we're going to be seeing. It really stays true to the, the dialogue. It does take out some elements of plot because it's a movie and that's what happens, but the main storyline stays about the same. So yes, there are, are differences and some significant deviations from the original play, but it really stays true to the overall feel of the play. We also have the 1996 movie version featuring Leonardo DiCaprio and Claire Danes. I will say that this version is, well, it's really quite different from the main story, but the elements as far as the, the characters go and the main sorts of conflicts that we see are the same. And so um, this is one, I believe this movie is, is rated R. So if you'd like to see that movie, make sure that you have your parents' permission. The 1968 version is was at the time rated PG, would probably be rated PG-13 in the modern day. Um, we'll be taking out the, the parts of the, the, the play, which is only like a minute or two, that would be school appropriate. Inappropriate, I should say. <laughs> All right. And uh, now there's another, there's another movie called Shakespeare in Love. This is a 1998 movie with Gwyneth Paltrow uh, and Joseph, uh, did we say Fines? Um, and this is a rather charming account, um, totally fictional account. Um, well, I suppose since Romeo and Juliet is fictional, but meaning it doesn't stay true to the, to anything that is verifiable uh, in history, but it's a, a rather charming account of uh, how Shakespeare came to write Romeo and Juliet and his muse in doing that. Now, again, there is no relationship between um, the movie and actual history, but it is quite charming. 
but it's rated R. So once again, if you'd like to see that movie, make sure you get your parents' permission. So we've got lots of different versions of this story. Here at the top, we see uh, two characters from West Side Story. Here we have Romeo and Juliet. Here we have uh, Romeo and Juliet as played by Leonard Whiting and Olivia Hussey. That'll be the movie version that we see. Here we have Leonardo DiCaprio and Claire Danes in the 1996 version. And here we have Gwyneth Paltrow and Joseph Fiennes in Shakespeare in Love. So lots of different interpretations of the story. There are probably way more. These are the ones that I'm familiar with and probably some of the most popular. So this story has come about through time and just keeps coming back. It keeps getting reimagined. So why do we look at Romeo and Juliet? Um, well, one, it's about two te teenagers. So in ninth grade English, it makes sense for us to pick a story that students can relate to. So and it's, it's about the consequences of choices and circumstances. And that's something that young people are dealing with even to this day. There are themes that we can relate to, infatuation, lust, love, jealousy, secrecy, mentorship, all types of relationships, revenge, rivalry, and these are things that come up all through different societies and generations. And I would argue that the story is not just a flimsy romance, but a rich action and intrigue-packed tragedy. So there's a lot of stuff going on in Romeo and Juliet um, that make it um, make for great drama. All this is packaged together with the genius of Shakespeare. So we've got his language and his characterizations and the storyline and all of these things that bring it together to be something um, quite beautiful. Okay, there's some things that we're going to be watching for as we are watching and watching the, the movie Romeo and Juliet and reading excerpts from Romeo and Juliet. One is wordplay. We've talked about this. There, um, there's all kinds of example of humor, puns, insults, metaphors, personification, similes, all this kind of stuff. Um, lots of puns. Of course, that's one of our vocabulary words. So we're going to be watching for wordplay. Some of that wordplay is just in how it sounds and the rhythm of it. So um, not, not just what we've listed here, um, but other stuff as well. It's everywhere. It really what is what makes Shakespeare Shakespeare, all this wordplay. We're going to see foreshadowing and irony. Now, foreshadowing is when there are events or dialogue that give us hints as to what's going to be happening later. And sometimes we don't know if something is foreshadowing until after the event happens, so we can go back and take a look at that. So lots of foreshadowing. When you have the word for in front of a word, you can expect it means something that happens before. So shadowing before or giving a hint. So a shadow is more like a hint of something. It's not completely spelled out. So um, a hint of something before is how we might break that word down. And then irony. We've talked about different types of irony in class and you also talked about that in, in eighth grade. Um, and specifically, we'll be looking at literary irony. This is um, now you might uh, th there are some crossovers here with situational irony. Literary irony is when through character or a plot development, a result different from that stated or intended happens. And then we also have dramatic irony and that this is one of your vocabulary phrases. And of course, dramatic irony is when the audience or reader knows something that's going on, but the character Characters do not. Um, so this make this is what makes for really good drama. And then we know something. We might be watching a movie, and we know that the main character is being chased, um, and we know um, where the 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 villains are hiding. Um, we know where the characters should and shouldn't go, but they don't know. And so this makes for suspense and drama. And so we're going to find in Romeo and Juliet, there are things that we know that the characters don't. And that, that, that kind of lack of information or miscommunication or events that happen that confuse things. We know some of what's going on, but the characters do not. And that makes for good drama. So we're going to be looking for these things. Wordplay, 
foreshadowing and irony, literary irony, and dramatic irony. There might be some other types of irony that we see as well. And then we're also going to see oppositions. Um, we're going to see lots of figurative language and descriptions related to light versus dark. So we'll see certain things happening at night and certain other things happening during the day. We'll see the relationship between youth and age, the moon versus the stars, and love versus hate. There might be even more, but lots of oppositions. And we'll be looking for these, um, all of these things, when we look at Romeo and Juliet. So wordplay, foreshadowing and irony, and oppositions. You can think of oppositions as opposing forces or opposing ideas or even opposing images. All right, now we have talked about literal language versus figurative language. You might remember these were some of our first vocabulary words. We're going to be looking for this in Romeo and Juliet. Remember that literal language, this is where you say exactly what you mean. Uh, if the, the dog was brown, we can see uh, an image of that dog, and that's to be taken literally. There's no comparison. There's no exaggeration. There's no understatement. There's no irony. It just, that dog is brown. Now, if we said that dog was as brown as chocolate, then we would be getting into figurative language. It's not exactly, we don't take it exactly literally. So figurative language, remember we're comparing, exaggerating, understating the situation. In figurative language, we're using similes, metaphors, personification, hyperbole, and other figures of speech, figures of speech or figurative language to make your writing or speech more interesting entertaining or meaningful. You can get these really cool images when you're using figurative language and you can get at the deeper meaning, deeper meanings of things as well. Here's an example from Romeo and Juliet. This is Romeo. He sees Juliet up on a balcony and he sees, he sees her up there and he says, but soft, what light through yonder window breaks? It is the east, and Juliet is the sun. Arise, fair sun, and kill the envious moon, who is already sick and pale with grief, that thou, her maid, art far more fair than she. You see here, there's lots of figurative language going on. Soft is more like saying, but hey, but look, okay, soft, that's using words in a different way. But we see Romeo saying, what light through yonder window breaks? Now he might see a light in the window, but really who he's talking about is the light of Juliet. It is the east and Juliet is the sun, a metaphor there. Meaning she's that bright, she's that wonderful. Arise, fair sun, so... He's asking her to come forward and kill the envious moon. Here we have a personification. Kill the envious moon who is already sick and pale with grief. Another metaphor. If the moon is already sick and pale with grief, the moon is ready to go down. He's saying, Juliet, come out and let the darkness go away. Perhaps his own darkness that thou, her maid, art far more fair than she. Also, coming back to this idea that perhaps the moon, um, comparing the moon to Juliet as the sun, because the moon is bright, but not as bright as Juliet. So, lots of figured language going on here. We're going to see this, especially when the main characters are talking. They say some of the most beautiful language. And um, we can also see a lot of um, iambic pentameter. 
we look at this first line, we can see, but soft, what light through yonder window breaks. Ooh, that sounds like iambic pentameter. Let's exaggerate it a little bit. But soft, what light through yonder window breaks. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ooh, we have a line of iambic pentameter here, and we're going to talk about that here in the next slide. All right, so we're also looking for um, not only figurative language, but we're looking for iambic pentameter. So Shakespeare uses iambic pentameter for important characters and events, and different types of characters speak in different ways and with different rhythms. We're gonna see lower class servants speaking in a different way from upper class characters such as Romeo and Juliet and their parents. And uh, we will also see that Shakespeare plays with structure, so the structure of the lines to achieve particular rhythms. So we're going to be looking for that. You guys, I'm going to be honest, it's going to be hard for us to look at, at these in the way that we would have looked at. If we were doing this together in class, um, I will try to give you guys some examples of this. Um, but some of this, you're going to be kind of on your own to look for, just to be honest. And then we're also going to be looking for elements of tragedy. Since Romeo and Juliet is a tragedy, we're going to see many common elements of the, the tragic form. And going to cover the elements of tragedy in the next slideshow. So these are just two more things we're going to be watching for, the rhythm of the language and elements of tragedy. So that gives you a nice little overview of Romeo and Juliet. We'll um, continue the overview in our next slideshow when we're talking about um, elements of tragedy. Um, okay, but I also want to provide you guys with just some basic stuff about setting and characters. So we'll be getting into um, elements of, of tragedy in the next slideshow, but let's talk a little bit about some of the, the characters and other things um, that are going on, or will be going on. All right, the setting, Romeo and Juliet takes place in Verona, Italy. Now you might recall in our um, in our looking at our video on the Renaissance that there were parts of Italy, particularly in port areas, um, that were very they were successful economically because of trade, um, and so we can Im imagine that Verona um, would be right in the middle of that economically prosperous area so that the families that we talk about living in Verona, Italy would be very, very rich and right in the middle of that very um, prominent and prosperous time. So um, this is where uh, the story takes place. Now, here's a couple of sort of idealized um, versions of what Verona might have looked like. I understand this comes from a video game. Here's a more modern day look at Verona. You can see there are still lots of historical structures shown here, a very dense city now, um, but beautiful, definitely beautiful in some right. Um, let's see, We're, you can imagine in Romeo and Juliet that things happen on the streets of Verona. Now the streets of Verona would be very different in uh, generally speaking from our streets these streets would be cobblestone they'd be very narrow because they're not designed for cars mostly designed for people walking perhaps people on horseback but mostly people walking um, so and you can see that the buildings would be close together so that people could see each other from across the way this would be kind of in a downtown area um, if you've if you've ever been to um, to Italy, you'll notice um, things are are very dense and crowded. Traffic is kind of crazy, 
parking spots are very hard to come by because the streets simply weren't made for cars. So when I see people driving cars in Italy, you see lots of scooters, you see lots of smaller cars, and that's very practical. Um, you've, you guys have seen smart cars, and I've also often wondered why they're called that. I think that's because it's really smart to get a little car in Italy um, so that you can uh, drive it in these little spaces and hopefully even find a parking space. So pretty, pretty cool looking streets. So that's what we can imagine. This is um, a picture of a, a balcony that we might imagine that um, Juliet spoke from. Now, this particular area is a, a, a kind of a tourist trap for people who want to see where Juliet and Romeo had their tryst. Well, that that always, I, I laugh at that because, of course, that didn't actually happen or probably didn't happen. Um, but we like to romanticize these types of places. So we can imagine maybe Juliet standing up here and Romeo maybe having climbed this wall and talked to Juliet from up here. All right, more on setting here. When does the story take place? So this is a, an interesting question. Now, the earliest written source of Romeo and Juliet um, is Novo, Il Novolino that was published in the 1400s. Now, the author says that the events happened in his lifetime. Now, he's saying the story of Romeo and Juliet is not fictional. We don't know if it's true or not, but it is ultimately fiction. And we know that Shakespeare wrote the play sometime in the 1590s. Remember, it was circa 1595, but he clearly sets it in the past. So he's talking about everything in the past tense um, based on the prologue. So set in the past... But we do need to know that Elizabethan theater was non-naturalistic. That means that someone like Shakespeare wouldn't necessarily have made something happening during a particular time, maybe with the exception of the history plays. But um, so they're not, they're called non-naturalistic. So they're meant to be more general and universal. Um, so that Shakespeare likely didn't cry to, try to create like a specific time period in events or styles. So you would have seen that the players on the stage probably would have been dressed in contemporary clothes. So contemporary for the time. You also see um, lots of versions of Romeo and Juliet in which people are dressed in the clothing of their particular time. So there's no exact year mentioned, although we can make some assumptions based on the original versions. Um, but it's just not clear. It seems to arise in the 1400s in Italy, um, although we do have some earlier references to the Montagues and Capulets. All right, so that's a bit more on setting there. Now, um, another question on when the story takes place. It takes place over a very short period of time. We see the play taking place over a much shorter period of time than was shown in some earlier versions. Four days. Four days from Sunday to Thursday morning. So about, about four days total. Um, now, based on the text of the play... It takes place in the middle of July, and we base this on the dialogue um, between characters. Um, we find out that Juliet is about to turn 14, so she's 13 at the time. She's about to turn 14 at the end of July, um, and we, we know it's at the end of July because the characters talk about her birthday being on Lamas Eve which is about two weeks away. So we have make some inferences based on information provided. And there we have a picture of Romeo and Juliet from the 1968 version of the movie. So Juliet here is meant to be about 13. We don't have an exact age for Romeo, but he's probably somewhere between 16 and 18. Uh, these actual actors are 16 and 17. All right, so um, let's talk a little bit about the characters and conflicts in Romeo and Juliet. 
Now there's a main conflict in Romeo and Juliet, and this conflict is a, um, a, a squabble or a feud between the family Capulet and the family Montague. So we have a family conflict or a family feud. We have the Capulets. Juliet is um, a member of the Capulet family. To remember which family is which, I think of Juliet Capulet. So there's a little rhyme going on there. And if you can remember Juliet Capulet, you'll remember that Romeo is a Montague. So we have Juliet Capulet and Romeo Montague. And of course, Romeo is a member of this family. Juliet's a member of this family. And these two families do not get along. All right, let's, uh, let's take a look at the, some of these characters. You will want to take some notes here. Please don't worry about drawing pictures of these characters. You can certainly go back and do that if you'd like or along the way, but to, please don't worry about that. All right, so um, in this picture here, we show some of the main characters in Romeo and Juliet. This is, does not show all of the characters, so please don't take this as a complete character list. I will provide you guys with a complete character list before you start the movie, so you can actually um, have that in front of you as we go along. All right, so you can see here, this is this uh, little picture is sort of divided up into families. So on this side, we have Lord and Lady Montague. On this side, we have Lord and Lady Capulet. And you can sort of imagine a line down the middle where the people on this side are related to the Capulet family and the people on this side are related to the Montague family. The people in the middle are um, maybe considered neutral, but even they have relationships between the two um, the two sides. Okay, so let's uh, let's start with Juliet's sides or the Capulet side. So of course we have Juliet. She's um, the main female character um, in the play. Now her mother and father are Lord and Lady Capulet. So you have Lord Capulet. Being the head of the household, we have Lady Capulet. Now, we know by the use of Lord and Lady that these are, these titles, that these are upper class individuals. Um, we will also hear Lord and La Lady Capulet. Lord Capulet will, is, can be referred to as just Capulet. Just Capulet. All right, so we have Juliet and her parents. We're going to see that Juliet and her mom, they, um, they might have a little different way of looking at the world, um, as might be common between a teenage girl and her mother. Okay, who else do we have here now? Juliet has a nurse. Now, nurse is kind of like um, a, a governess, um, not so much a medical nurse, um, but this would be the nurse would be someone that Juliet would really rely on, have a very strong relationship with. In fact, you could say that Juliet has a stronger relationship with the nurse than she does with her mother or her father. So a very strong relationship here. All right. So we on this side, we have Count or County Paris. Um, he's an arranged suitor for Juliet. So... Lord and Lady Capulet are looking to County or Count Paris to marry Juliet. Now again, Juliet's probably about, she's, well, she is 13, going on 14 in the play. Paris is probably somewhere between 24 and 30 years old. So he's older. That would not have been that strange back in this time. So before you label him as a pedophile, these kinds of arranged marriages would not be unusual. These kind of marriages made mostly for economic and status purposes. Uh, we do see that Count Paris is a relative to Prince Aeschylus, and we'll get to him in just a moment. Also on this side, so we've talked about Nurse, we've ta talked about Count Paris, we've talked about Lord and Lady Capulet. We also have Tybalt. Tybalt is Juliet's cousin. Now, Tybalt is a hothead. We're going to see that he has quite a temper and he thinks quite highly of, him, of himself, um, but he is a member of the Capulet clan. We also have Peter. Peter's not a main character, but he does come up 
and is associated with the Capulet side, um, and he is Nurse's servant. So Nurse has a servant. All right, so that's the 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 Capulet side. Over here we have Romeo, Romeo Montague. Now these two are tragic lovers. Um, but, of course, these two families are feuding. So, on this side, we've got Mercutio. Now, Mercutio is Romeo's good friend. Mercutio is a very sarcastic individual, and um, but he is Romeo's very good friend. Let's see, we also have Benvolio. We, Benvolio is Romeo's friend and cousin. Now, we're going to hear uh, people referred to as cuz or cousin. Um, that can mean um, a good friend or relative. Benvolio is kind of a peacemaker. We can't say the same for Mercutio. Um, you can imagine that Mercutio and Tybalt, well, they're, they're, their personalities are actually similar in some ways. Um, but Benvolio is Romeo's very best friend and um, a peacemaker overall. We have Balthazar. Balthazar is not a big character. He is important in some things that he does, especially toward the end, but he's Romeo's servant. And then, of course, we have Lord and Lady Montague. Lord and Lady Montague are Romeo's parents. Again, we might see Lord Montague referred to just as Montague, um, so keep that in mind. So here we have the Montague side. Here in the middle we've got Prince Aeschylus. He is the basically the, the local law enforcement or ruler of the city of Verona. And he try, also tries to act as a peacemaker between the two families and as we will see he may or may not be successful. We also have Friar Lawrence. Now a friar is kind of a, a humble servant of God that would act as um, the person in a community to um, provide religious services um, such as baptisms and um, confession and um, basic things. So this is not like um, uh, someone high up in the church that's wearing a big fancy hat. This is a very humble servant wearing typically just a basic robe and sandals and will often um, do things that are um, of, of service to the community. So here we have Friar Lawrence. Now we see that Friar Lawrence acts as a confidant or someone that both Romeo and Juliet talk to. Um, you see here it says co-conspirator. We'll see what that means as we go along. But there is a uh, maybe a little conspiracy to make some things happen between these two. But both Romeo and Juliet rely on Friar Lawrence for advice and assistance. So that gives you a basic feel for the characters in Romeo and Juliet. Again, I will provide you guys with an overall list. So as you're watching the movie, you can get a feel for who those different characters are. The other thing I wanted to do is to put some faces to names. You're going to be watching a movie and being able to know uh, who, what some of these characters look like in the movie will be very helpful. So here we have Lord and Lady Capulet. Now, yes, the side sort of switched from the last graphic we looked at. Um, they are, of course, Juliet's parents. Um, now, interestingly, um, they, at the beginning of the play, they actually talk to Juliet about what she wants in marriage, um, to some extent. Um, and we're going to see maybe the relationship between these two isn't, um, isn't ideal. That'll be how it's portrayed in the movie, at least. So it's an interpretation. Uh, let's see, this is Nurse. Um, and um, she does act as a messenger between Romeo and Juliet. And both Romeo and Juliet trust her. Here's Juliet, um, played by Olivia Hussey. Um, she really, in many ways, is a typical 13-year-old, but she is definitely under the constraints of, um, of noble society in Renaissance Italy. This is Tybalt. Um, he, again, he's Juliet's cousin, and he's Romeo's rival. So Tybalt versus Romeo. Timult versus Romeo. Um, and he's always looking to kind of start a fight. And he, he, among all of the Capulets, really hates the Montagues. 
all right this is Paris um, he's the one who wants to marry Juliet so County Paris here's Friar Lawrence in the movie uh, again he is a confident confidant for both Juliet and Romeo um, and he's trying to figure out how to make these two families stop fighting um, here's the prince Prince Aeschylus, he's trying to do the same thing. Now, he's related to Mercutio and Paris, and really, he's just trying to do the right thing. Not always successful. We'll see how that works. Again, here's Romeo of the Montagues. Here's Benvolio. Remember, he's a peacekeeper and Romeo's best friend. He just wants what's best for Romeo. Here's Mercutio. He's also Romeo's friend. Um, he's a little more hot-headed, kind of sarcastic. Um, so on this side, we have the Montagues. And on this side, we have the Capulets. So just wanted to help you guys to put some faces with some names when we start watching the movie next week. All right, so um, our next slideshow will be the elements of tragedy. Um, and so um, now you'll be taking the, the quiz on the introduction to Romeo and Juliet. And then next, you're going to be watching the video slideshow on the elements of tragedy and um, taking some notes and, um, and taking a quiz. So uh, thanks for listening and we'll see you for the elements of tragedy.